All righty, you are ready to go. Awesome. Got it. We are. So thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon. Um, so um, this is the presentation for the Associate Dean and Director position for the Graduate School. Um, my name is Karen Jones. I'm one of the candidates today. I know that Friday afternoon is not always the best time to, to do these types of interviews, especially when a lot of people are traveling um, for the chancellor's ball that's coming up this weekend. So a lot of people are on their way to Chicago for that exciting event. So anyway, um, I'm just gonna jump in today with some, some, um, some information that I've prepared for you for, uh, for consideration for the position. Now, again, thank you for coming. I, uh, it's greatly appreciated. So there's my official thank you, okay. So um, I like to think of every interview that, that we undergo is a, um, we're trying to figure out, we've got a position and who's the best candidate or the best fit for that position. Um, so I've had the opportunity to try on this position, if you will, for about 10 months. I really love the position. I love the people that I work with here in the graduate school and working with a lot of the constituencies and the academic units um, from around campus. Um, I hope that, that you agree and <laughs> potentially this, this um, um, arrangement can continue into the future. Um, so a little bit about myself. Um, I am from Texas. I grew up um, in the Houston area, suburb of Houston. I went to school at Texas A&M University and I have a degree in veterinary physiology. Um, and my degree, I had the opportunity to train. I was one of the very first people to clone a cow using adult cells, um, which was kind of a hot topic back at um, like the turn of the century. When I came to um, SIU though, I found out that the cattle in Southern Illinois are kind of different than the cattle in Texas. And no, it doesn't have anything to do with their genetics or anything. It has to do with the grasses that they eat. Um, there's a fungus that's in the grass here that, that um, is an endocrine disruptor and um, it messes with the reproductive functions of these animals. And so that became my research topic um, when I came um, here. That got me through um, tenure and promotion and all the way up. Um, um, where I was given a uh, full professor uh, right around 2010. So I've been a faculty member on campus for 23 years. Um, I have been a director of graduate studies for um, both master's and doctoral programs. I was the chair of two very diverse departments. One was animal science, food and nutrition. And I was also the department chair for plant, soil and agricultural systems. These two positions gave me insights into lots of different types of um, uh, education that we give. So everything from professional degrees through the um, uh, becoming a registered dietitian to teaching degrees. We, we um, collaborated with the School of Education to um, have ACT teachers, basic science, um, management science, so more applied science, um, and so I got a feel for a lot of different disciplines in those two roles. I was also the interim associate dean for agriculture for a while, for about a year. And currently I'm serving as the interim associate dean and director for the graduate school. And I've been in this capacity for since July 1, so for about 10 months. <clears throat> Excuse me. I am married. I have two children and two grand grandchildren that are just spectacular. Um, a little bit about my hobbies. I um, have a very large dog that I like to do lots of things with, including showing in obedience trials. I quilt in my spare time and also do a little bit of gardening. So try to be, try to maintain that work-life balance, if you will. Um, so also about me, I think it's important that, you know, I, I do think about what are the, the guide rails, if you will, of how I conduct my life. Um, so what is my North Star? I, I do believe in excellence and that we should be setting the bar high in whatever capacity that we're in, um, whatever job or position that, that we have undertaken. Um, I also believe in integrity. I, I, I think I'm honest almost to a fault, principled. I have a hard time sometimes um, 
keeping things um, to myself that I think would help improve other people's knowledge of certain situations. Um, so I like to be transparent and, um, and I don't think it's a bad thing. I think that's a good thing. Um, I have high respect for my colleagues on campus and for the staff and the students that we train here. Um, we're, we're an incredible institution. And I think that if we all dealt with each other with that same level of respect that we would be making great strides in helping people feel like they belong here at SIU, for example. And I do believe that in the, the role of the associate dean and director position, you need to have a mentality of service. This is a service leadership position. We are in, um, we are here to help our students in our academic units um, with the day-to-day -day activities of graduate education, all the way from recruiting, retention, um, and um, graduation, and maybe even some things that are after graduation as well, we'll talk about. So SIU, <clears throat> um, I think of it as a big ship, and I don't know why my, my leadership seems to have disappeared on my screen, but anyway, the, that we are all in this together. We are um, part of a, you know, this, this vessel, if you will, that's SIU. Maybe that you can think of the chancellor as the captain and he's helped us set a course through the creation of our Imagine 2030 strategic plan. Where are we going? Um, and uh, hopefully we can all get on board for, for, with the pillars that he has helped us create and, um, and work together. And like a ship, I think we are, gonna, um, we are going to be able to cruise along together or we're going to sink and fail together. It, we can't we can't dis, um, discombobulate or disjoint those two things. We're all in this together, and we need to learn to work and collaborate together um, if we're to be successful. So I've got a lot of water imagery here. I, I grew up on the coast, and I, I like to think in boats. I don't know why, but I like to think of. Here we are, we've got a strategic plan that set our course. We, we, we're we gonna be going um, uh, where the pillars take us. And quite often we like to say, we, we know what we're gonna do and the, the shortest path to get there is from point A to point B and it's a straight line. But when you're sailing, you know that the winds of change are always upon us and it's very rare that you actually get a wind that's gonna be pushing from the back of A and going to B exactly where you wanna go. So you have to learn how to do in sailing what they call is tacking. And you kind of make zigzags as you go back and forth across that body of water to actually get to where you're going. So we'll work in one direction for a while, then we got to change course a little bit and, and zigzag in the other direction. And I kind of think of that as our institution. So sometimes our emphasis on recruitment and retention, sometimes it's on how are we going to, to get that R1 status, sometimes, you know, so our, our, our focus, if you will, changes um, as we're moving across this body of water, but we're always still trying to get to that point, which is a successful um, completion, if you will. I don't know that you ever complete a strategic plan, but getting us in that direction um, that, that we've articulated in our strategic plan. And I think it's really important that if we think about um, what Charles Darwin says, which it, it's not the strongest of the species that survives nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. And so I, um, I struggle sometimes with the people around me going, well, that's not the way we used to do it. Or we used to have these resources or um, any of the, the things that kind of capture more of how things used to be. Used to be. And my thing is, is that those winds are gone. They're behind us. We have new challenges and new goals that we're trying to achieve. And it's only whenever we look forward and we try to identify what is the change that's happening and how can we best adapt to the, the current environment that we're in, can we actually tack in the direction of our strategic plan. So we need to be thinking about how can we change, how can we be more resilient um, as we move forward. But what is the goal of graduate education. And I will posit that it is the transformation of our students to scholars and or the professional programs that they are uh, undertaking. 
that means that if we think about Bloom's taxonomy, um, which is um, basically the levels of learning, if you will, that we're moving up here to the very top of Bloom's taxonomy, which is we're evaluating, we're making decisions, and we're creating. And I, I like to think of us as the, the creation of new knowledge, the creation of new art, new poetry, what have you. But, but it's the creation of newness that, that makes graduate education unique. And um, this happens under the partnership of both um, the graduate school, which helps procedurally, and the academic units and the faculty, which are creating the curriculum. They're deciding how that curriculum is going to be delivered um, and how the training of, of those students is going to, to happen. And so it is a, a, a partnership that we need to create. The grad school's part of that, though, I believe is in facilitation. And what we're here to do is try to make an action or a process easier to simplify it. So how can we get those students into the pipeline, into the admissions pipeline easier? How can we get paperwork accomplished easier? How can we implement the, the, the instructions that Graduate Council gives us through the Graduate Catalog? How can we do those activities and actions in a way that is not burdensome, burdensome to the academic unit or burdensome to the student. That's kind of what I think of um, as part of our role and how in a, in a big level um, uh, description, how what the graduate school, the graduate school does. So I'm also a physiologist, like I told you, uh, with my degrees from the vet school. And so when we teach physiology, we teach the basic unit of life, which is the cell. And so a lot of things that we start with in physiology is we learn how cells work. So I kind of think about graduate school and what's the basic unit of what we do in the graduate school. And I this is my graphical representation of this. So you have the graduate school over here. We have lots of conversations and procedures that are going on with the individual academic unit could be with the faculty member, but that's the person that's in this academic unit. They're talking to the student. This could be a prospective student or a current student. And then of course that student's also talking to us. So we have all this communication that's going on. And if we break it down to there, that looks like it's pretty simple and, and fairly you know, straightforward. But in reality, it's much more complex. <laughs> so let's go back to the grad school here. And now then we're kind of like this centralized hub and we have all of these academic units that we're working with. And I think we did a count this last um, fall and I have 76, we have 76 um, doctoral and master's programs that we're working with on a daily basis. So this is even a simplified version of what we do here. So it can get be very complex because we're talking to a whole lot of different people um, simultaneously. And then you add in the students. So here's that communication between the grad school and the, the academic units. We're going to add in all of these students who are at different points in their educational um, journey. We're talking to them. The academic units are talking to them. We're trying to make sure that they're all getting the same message. Then we overlay all of that with those um, entities that influence what we're doing and saying. And I like to think of this as sort of this is the um, neurological system in a body or the endocrine, endocrine system, so the hormones and how it's acting on this whole system and how it's working. So we do take our direction from graduate council, and I'm glad that, that Craig is here. He's the, the chair of graduate council, and I appreciate your involvement in this today. Um, but then we also have others that are involved. Um, we have service units that we partner with, like CIE, financial aid, um, admissions. There's lots of other components that are in there as well. And I'm sorry, I can't see everybody on the screen here. There could be other people in here that, that I don't wanna miss if you're here. Um, I think Caleb said maybe he was coming, but anyway. Um, and we also take our directions from administration because of course we are still answerable to, to all the upper administration and our, uh, our constituent groups. So the, 
the students themselves and we interact with their, their groups, their RSOs, the GPSC and the union, the GAU. And so those entities and bodies, they're all talking to us, we're talking to them all to, to try and make sure that this experience that we're calling graduate education happens and it happens with as few roadblocks as possible. But why do we care? Um, I've already mentioned a couple of times that we do have a strategic plan called Imagine 2030, and that plan has pillars. So this was a plan that was developed by um, lots of constituency groups, students, the community, um, faculty, um, anyway. And they came up with five different pillars, student success and engagement, diversity, equity, inclusion, branding and partnerships, research, innovation, and sustainability. So those are the five kind of overarching um, ideas, if you will, that, that we are trying to strive to achieve here at SIU before the year 2030. And a lot of those, I think at times we, we think when we first read them, this is all about undergraduate education. But in reality, if we look at our fall 2022 enrollment numbers, graduate and professional students made up 29% of our student body. That's a huge portion of our student body. And we can't achieve our plan unless we include student, our graduate and professional students in all of the activities that we're thinking about on campus, or we're not going to achieve the goals of Imagine 2030, in my mind, anyway. So, <clears throat> we were kind of wondering what was going on with our graduate students. And so um, we were able to identify and find a student survey to um, help us trying to kind of take a snapshot of where we are as far as our graduate students and what they think about um, their academic programs and their experiences here in Carbondale and the SIU campus. So we sent out a survey to a little over 2,600 students in January um, we gave them until the first part of February, and I'll tell you why that was so quick um, in just a second. But we had 278 respondents that, that answered our survey, and I'm giving you this great big long link that because all of the results for that entire survey are there, um, and you can look at the results for all the questions. I'm just going to give you a couple of the survey results um, today. So if we look, um, well, so here is one of the questions I picked out. If you had to make the decision to attend graduate or professional school all over again, would you? Okay, and then we have three questions here. Choose the same field of study, choose the same program, choose the same university. And then it's on a Likert scale from definitely to definitely not. And then we have a prefer not to respond. Right here, if you look, there is a cutoff, kind of a white line that goes through there. Everything to the left of this line is in the positive category, definitely, probably, might or might not. And everything on the right, kind of the bluish colors, are the probably not definitely. And so what I did is I went through and I added up the, 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 um, the percentages in, in between the left and the right side of this white line. And if we look at this, choose the same field of study, 91% of our, our students said that they would choose that, that same field of study. If we look at the program, we kind of go down 10%, we're at 81%. And if we look at the university, we're down here at the low C's, okay, at 71%. And to me, that's a little bit indicative of there's something that's happening at the institutional level, right, that, that the students are not particularly um, thrilled with. And so th there's areas of improvement that we definitely can make. So one of the other questions that I uh, pulled out of this survey is this one, which is, um, which of the following would you most like the university to prioritize with regard to attention and resources. And they got to pick three um, of a lot of, of different um, uh, categories. I chose to label the, the ones that were the top five or six, um, just so you could see what are the, the, the what it is that the students would like us to change. Um, the very top one is financial aid or support. If we go down, we have mental health, so mental health services, 
um, down to number three, academic progress, quality or engagement. Then the next one down is career development. And these two were close enough to tied that I just included them both. So it's just faculty advising, the graduate program climate and actually belonging into that program, okay? So I think that that gives us some ideas about where the challenges are that our, our students are having. Now the graduate school doesn't necessarily have direct influence on, on these things, but we could do things like gather this evidence and help inform our, our administration that, that these are the things that the graduate students have told us that they think are important. We also used this survey um, in an event that we had, which was on February 13th. And that's one of the reasons why we quickly did that survey so that we could get the data and, and analyze it a little bit, um, because we wanted to present this at an event that we had scheduled, which was the Graduate Student Recruitment and Retention Action Planning event. So this event, was a campus-wide event. We invited all of the deans, the school directors, our directors of graduate studies, their assistants. And we also included a panel of students, our graduate students to actually talk to us and, and um, have them tell us or, or, or have an exchange, a conversation with where, where are the roadblocks? What are the challenges that they feel that they're having on campus? We did some other activities and basically um, there was a, a some table work and a bunch of stuff that happened that day, but we were able to identify some themes that came out from that day and, and create a report. And this is a report that um, that, that we um, then took the, the, the most probable things that the graduate school could help with, okay? And so here are the top items that the graduate school can help with to help to assist our students, okay? So number one was improved processes. So we do a lot of, um, you know, admissions types of things, getting um, the paperwork going for um, our international students to get visas, assistantships, all of that kind of um, process is handled in our department. And so we are trying to improve those processes in of themselves, but as importantly is we're trying to communicate with all the parties involved um, on how the process works, why it works that way, and what we need so that we can process the paperwork in a more efficient manner. So we're trying some new things um, as far as communication goes. So not only are we doing emails, um, we're, we're doing, um, well, some of this is emails, but we're using a system called Navigate that the recruiters oftentimes use for undergraduate students to communicate with large numbers of students. And so now then we're doing some direct communications with the students and being a little bit less reliant on the traditional communication, which is, you know, you send a message to the dean, the dean sends it to the, the um, a school director, the school director sends it to the dog, the dog sends it to their assistants and the assistant sends it out to the email, the emails out to the students. So that's a lot of steps in there. So when appropriate, we are starting to do that direct communication with the students. Okay. We're trying to, we're keeping the, the academic units in the loop. We want to know, let them know that this is happening, but we also are being a little bit less um, completely dependent on that message going through the trickle down way of communicating. Um, and some of those communications have been about professional development. Um, so our, the students want professional development. So we've been doing a new series um, called Let's Talk Graduate Studies. So we've been talking about things, everything from how to prepare your thesis and dissertation, in notes, um, how to um, write grant proposals, fellowships, how to, uh, what, what a typical academic interview looks like, how you might prepare for that. So we've been doing some of those kind of professional development type activities, as well as identifying some travel funds that the students can actually apply for and, and go and present their work at the scientific, or not necessarily scientific, but at their d discipline specific conferences and meetings um, and whatever that looks like as appropriate. Um, so the, we're also trying to help our communication by improving our website. Um, it, 
a lot of that information was on the website, has been on the website, but it's been difficult to find. So it didn't necessarily make really intuitive sense that, that, you know, if you drill down here, you're going to find the information that you want. So we've been working on trying to make that a little bit um, easier to use in that respect and a little bit more visually appealing. Um, that's a, a thing that will never be done. We're going to continue to always be looking at our website. But then probably the most important one is this financial one. And uh, I'll just tell you that the graduate school has um, no influence on what stipend rates are or how much we spend in stipends. So, I, but, but we can do some things to help move the conversation forward about stipends and stipend rates. Um, things like collecting the data here, sharing that with GAU, GPSC, with graduate council, um, so that that can become a topic of conversation for the campus community. I do feel like that topic has, has um, is getting the appropriate attention and we should be seeing some changes hopefully in the near future on, on um, how stipend rates could be modified. But we're also doing some other things like um, we're talking about um, uh, how, when units find out what their uh, stipend will be. So we had a committee called the, the TAA allocation, which is the teaching allocation uh, allowance that basically the university gets from the state of Illinois. We kind of know how much money we're getting and can we tell the units that earlier so that they can use that as recruitment tools so they can plan on which students that they want to uh, make offers early, like in the, in the fall semester, instead of waiting until February or March in the spring semester so that, that, that we can have that information readily available so that units can, can make informed decisions. So we're doing things like that. So I went through and I, I, I picked a few things that we've accomplished, but I've also decided I was gonna make sort of a brainstorming list of what we've done in the last 10 months. I think it's pretty impressive. I hope that you agree. <laughs> but So we transitioned from under the provost um, org chart into the VCR grad school chart. Um, and so we have a new, well, Dr. Sitsoulis is new to SIU, but um, we've been doing a lot of coaching up and he came with a vast experience in graduate school um, dean position. And so that, that's been a good fit. I think that, that he's learning us and we've been learning some ideas from him as well. We've had two um, ad hoc committees, the TAA allocation committee I just alluded to. So we have a new formula for distribution that is based on um, measurable criteria. So which units get which money is, is based on tangible items that are now all shared with those units. Um, we have a graduate enrollment committee that is now informing our recruitment and retention folks. We've transitioned a lot of the paperwork to digital signatures, which makes things move much more quickly. Um, we were able to um, develop and disperse travel grant dollars for our graduate students, $500 up to $500 each. Uh, we had a graduate student fair that was targeted to our internal students, so our um, undergraduate juniors and seniors, they were invited to come to a fair where we could talk about graduate programs that they might be interested in. We had the um, graduate student recruitment and retention event that I spoke about just a minute ago. We're doing Let's Talk Graduate Studies. I also mentioned that, but we're trying to do that on a monthly basis. Um, and we're going to expand it a little bit to where it's not just for students, but it's gonna be for faculty and for um, directors of graduate programs and their assistants. And we're gonna start doing that as well. And this first one, we're gonna have one next week that we're gonna have over in the um, chancellor's lounge in the student center. And we're inviting everybody to, to just come, let's have a conversation. It's not necessarily a, a scripted program, but we need to talk about whatever the campus needs to talk about. And so we're trying to make ourselves more accessible um, through that type of event. Um, I am very proud of this, this uh, admits and registration funnel. That's what this chart is over here on the, on the right. So if we look 
at this chart, this goes back to 2019. So we have 2019, 2020, 21, 22, 23. And if we go back to this week in history, back those years, this is where we are as far as applications, admissions, and registration. <coughs> and if you look at it, you can see right now that we're up over 700 um, admitted students for this would be for fall 2023. And we're already up 11.2% um, on registrations for, for fall. So we're, I think that we're on a positive tra trajectory and um, that that's hopeful signs that our graduate student enrollment will be up in the fall semester. Um, we can hope. Okay. We've also, um, had a, an audit and updated our I-20 processes, which is, that's the paperwork that we need to get our international students their visas. And we've had numerous policy updates that we've been working with, um, with graduate council to accomplish. So looking forward, um, this is kind of what I see us doing as we move forward, if I get the position. Um, we're gonna look for actionable improvements in all of our processes and also as well as our communication communication plans. We want to think about how technology like Slate, Teams, et cetera, how can we use those to, to help us um, be better at our, our core jobs. Um, I think we need to be thinking about intentional recruitment and we now have a, a recruitment person in the graduate school and um, we're gonna start having her do a lot more um, outreach to the academic units to see how she can help all the academic units um, think about their recruitment, develop materials, you know, ask some questions about, about how many students that they, they think they can handle, how many they want, and we can think about strategies for those programs to move them forward. Um, I think that the graduate school um, would benefit from a updated operating paper. I know graduate council has been working on this for a while now, but I'd like to see that actually get pulled over the finish line if we can in the near future, um, hopefully maybe next year. Um, I think we need to decrease our reliance on paper processes. Um, we can just track things more easily um, if we have a digital trail and things move more quickly when we have digital uh, processes that work well. Increased transparency. I think we need to have more of a face on campus um, and off campus, if you will, um, as far as recruiting students and that kind of thing. But we need to be accessible and available and, and help um, remove any barricades that might come up. And I think that we need to continue thinking about professional development opportunities for our students. I can't emphasize enough how much any of this, well, all of it is because of the great, wonderful graduate school staff. And we have great students here. Um, a lot of these ideas and what we've been able to implement are because of their input um, and their ideas that, and generation. So I think part of it is just listening to what the campus wants and then let's try to implement um, what makes sense when moving forward. So a huge, Huge thank you um, to those two groups, to Graduate Council, to all of our partnering um, departments and programs. Thank you because it's really us working through you and with you that, that leads to success for all of us. And then with that, I'm going to conclude my talk today and see if you have any questions. And again, thank you for coming. Let me see. Craig, I can't hear. Oh, there you are. Okay. Uh, here, I feel like I know the answer to this question from having worked with you, but I've been asking the others. So I'll go ahead and and mm -hmm. and and ask you here, um, what do you see uh, the role of the arts and humanities in um, the work of a vibrant graduate uh, community? Well, you know me, I, I, um, I'm a strong believer in the arts and humanities. That's sort of my secondary passion. That's how I relieve stress 
um, is by doing some of the creative works. I think that that we are a university, which means that that we, um, you know, we're not, uh, you know, a liberal arts college or a technology college, and so, so it is a, a comprehensive university, which includes arts and humanities. And let's face it, that th those are the, the the places I think anyway where creativity can truly abound. Um, I'm a a big one for the visual arts, but but also um, you know music and 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 stage performances and all those types of things. It, it's you're not a complete human unless you have balance in your life. In my my um, estimation, so I think that we we have a tendency to skip over some disciplines, and I don't think that that's intentional for for most folks. Um, that that we acknowledge that greatness and created creativity comes in many forms, and that we need to respect and um, um, appreciate all contributions and to our to our to the um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for 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 the the the, com the completeness of the human experience. So so I I think that. Everybody has a role to play. Everything has a role to play. Um, and life would be boring without the arts and humanities, quite honestly. All work and no, no color, no music, no whatever. And, and that's just dull. So, yeah. Thank you. Not a great answer, but anyway. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? So, you know, we've had that discussion, Craig, about going through the artistic process. And, and I said, I quilt. That's one of the things that I do, my passion. And, um, you know, just going through the process of developing um, a work. Um, it, it's, it, for me anyway, it's a different part of the brain. Um, and I really enjoy that. I, I think that that it helps me even when we're talking about conflicts with people that they're coming from different places and different um, backgrounds. And I can kind of think of that as the different media. I actually chose the, the picture I chose in my um, presentation of one of my quilts. I actually picked that one intentionally because it's a quilt, right? It uses the quilting technique. But it also is paint, so it's using different different medias to create the effect I was sort of looking for. So that's the Saluki quilt, um, and so I, I kind of think of it that way: like what colors, what what what's the message I'm trying to get across, and how can I use different um, materials and and media to to actually make that happen? And it it translates loosely into people. That we come with different things and we can create different um, experiences and, and different appreciations because we are different and what we bring to the table creates a great um, work in, of itself. So. I know Sarah's got a question for me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I really liked your graph on um, looking at the increase in um, admissions and yield. What are some of the things that you think were contributing to that? So um, I'll just start with, so, so some people in the room know this. Um, we had a, uh, one of those perfect storms, if you will, that happened last fall, um, where all of my, almost all of my admission staff um, at least the people whose primary role in, was in admissions were gone for one reason or another. And so um, we went to, uh, to graduate council and um, asked them if we could modify the procedures that, that we use to do those admissions. And they were kind enough to allow us to modify the procedures and to kind of share the responsibility for some of the, the work with the academic units. 
um, that allowed us to uh, streamline, if you will, the, the actual process. So it lets the admissions uh, staff actually do their admissions function and not all the back calculations that needed to be done. And so that actually has resulted in us being able to process more actual admissions. Um, we've asked graduate council to let us continue this and uh, through the beginning of the fall semester, we're assessing as we go, um, if this is really, if this is working, if this is beneficial, um, as far as the raw data um, that, that would be collected, we also need to, to, to bring in that how is it impacting the academic units? We have not done that questionnaire yet, but, um, but we do think that that is what has led to that increase in admissions and then the subsequent registrations. What's going on? That's Thank really you, Council. Yeah. I just feel kind of bad that it took a, you know, a, a, a challenging, um, storm, if you will, to, to let us actually go through and evaluate those processes and look for some efficiencies. We need to be doing that all the time and not just when we have issues. Anybody else? So what would you guys like to see the graduate school? Um, what changes could we make to better serve the campus community? Anybody? I'm, I'm glad to hear about the expansion of the um, Let's Talk graduate studies to include uh, faculty and the, the directors of graduate studies. Mm -hmm. uh, and because uh, just sort of watching that program develop over the course of your of your term, I think it's done a lot of things for folks. And I've I've often thought, gosh, I could use one in in this or that element of advising. And so uh, I think opening it up to that is is one of the things I. Um, it, it's less of an of an idea about what I would add to what you're doing than just to say yes. I think that that's going to be a beautiful addition. Good. Good. Because right now what we do is we have two workshops a year, one in the fall and one in the spring, um, where we try and update the, the programs and the faculty on what are the changes, but we don't really schedule time to, to have conversation. And um, there's a lot of things that you can't do in a big you know, room where you're talking to a large group that you could do one on one and actually get down to what's really, you know, what, what's really happening here and how can we help? So, yeah, I think it's a great idea. I'm glad we're doing it. Anybody else? If not, I got a 15 minute walk across campus. I'm gonna, gonna head that way <laughs> for my next meeting, if you don't mind. Thanks so much, Dr. Jones. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Well, thank you all for coming today. I know Friday afternoons aren't always the most well attended, um, but I do appreciate you coming and, and having interest in this position in the grad school. So 